Hi, I'm Dan Joyce. I'm the director and archaeologist at the Kenosha Public Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin, located on beautiful Lake Michigan between Chicago and Milwaukee. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the mammoths that we have found that uh, have been hunted by people uh, at the end of the Ice Age. And uh, one mastodon, three mammoths, and uh, we'll talk about some of the evidence we have and some of the things we still lack. We'll start with uh, the mud lake mammoth, uh, which is the actually the second uh, animal that was found in Kenosha County. Uh, this is in the early 1930s. Uh, they were putting a ditch through a marsh in order to in increase some drainage off of that marsh, dry it out a little bit uh, so they, they can graze cattle. And they hit a, uh, the whole foreleg of a juvenile mammoth, uh, not quite full grown, probably what we would call a teenager. Uh, but what's cool about the bones is that they were put into the Kenosha History Center, uh, which is another museum in town. And uh, they, at that time, no one noticed, but back in the 1990s, uh, myself and Dave Wason, an amateur archaeologist, uh, noticed that uh, there were cut marks on these bones that were made from stone tools. All kinds of little indentations, all kinds of uh, marks where they were wedge putting wedges between bones and trying to pull them apart when they were butchering them. Uh, really, really pretty definitive evidence of, of people using these animals and eating them. Uh, if they're not killing them, they're certainly scavenging them at this time. So we had people come in, uh, other archaeologists that we know, and, uh, and paleontologists as well. And we had uh, these bones analyzed. We had the, the, the cut marks looked at to see if they were really cut marks. Uh, it's pretty definitive that they are. A couple people still argue that they aren't on Mud Lake. But uh, if you look here, um, this is looking at the front knee joint. So you're basically looking from your elbow downward. So these are the two bones, the radius and the ulna, that are in your forearm or in the animal's front leg. And what's cool is you can see the wedge marks. They were, they were separating the upper, from the, the upper from the lower leg. There's a wedge mark here. There's one here. And they were separating the radius from the ulna, and they've got two right here. Uh, very, very definitive marks. And in addition to that, there's all kinds of uh, stone butchering marks on the, to on the rest of the bone itself. Uh, there was quite a bit of the foot found. And what's cool is they have a bunch of, bunch of butchering marks across all of these bones. There's a whole mass of bones in your wrist and your hand. Uh, same, in the, same in the mammoth. Uh, and the reason for that is that Mammoths actually stand on their toes, and there's a giant fat pad right here. And in order for their foot not to explode, there's a giant tendon, tendon around here to take all that weight and keep their foot together. So they're cutting through that tendon to take that foot apart, uh, probably to get to the fat pad, because I'm sure it was delicious. Uh, <laughs> back in uh, <laughs> the early 2000s, uh, 2004, myself, uh, at the Kenosha Public Museum and the Center for the Study of the First Americans, Rob Boggson and Mike Waters went back to Mud Lake to try to find where they originally found these bones in 1936. Uh, it was a great year to do that. It was very dry. Uh, this is still an active cattail marsh. What's cool about uh, it is that you can still see the 1936 ditch that they made. That's right here. And then you can see in this other photograph that's looking down the ditch. So we know exactly where the animal came from, uh, but finding an animal like this in a field, even when you have clues like that, is really a, looking for a needle in a haystack. But we took a little backhoe and we put in all kinds of trenches, and uh, we found spruce, uh, which you know obviously hasn't grown around here for 12,000 years at least. Uh, we dated it and it was 12,000 years old. Uh, we found absolutely no ma mammoth bones. Uh, however, we did find one mastodon tooth, which is the wrong animal, but eh, it's okay. Uh, the Fenske mastodon, uh, it's one of the earliest, actually it is the earliest discovery that we know of in Kenosha County. Uh, they found it, a railroad crew found it in 1919, uh, about six miles from where we're standing at the Kenosha Public Museum. And they found this giant femur. So this is the upper rear leg of uh, a mastodon. And one of the reasons you can tell it's a mastodon right away is that the bones are very 
thick. Mastodons have these, these skeletons that are very thick and bulky. Uh, mammoths have kind of long, skinnier bones. Uh, they're taller, uh, they're, they're less bulky in their bones. So you can tell a difference right away, uh, in addition to their teeth, which we talked about in another episode. Um, so this one, uh, we went back in uh, the late 90s, uh, tried to look in the area where it was right next to a railroad grade. Uh, so we used uh, electrical resistivity where we put probes in the ground and run a current between it, and we could tell if there's things underground. We used uh, electromag where we shoot magnetics into the ground, magnetic pulses, and it does the same thing. Uh, there was all kinds of stuff underground. Unfortunately, it was all from the railroad. Uh, old ties, old rails, you know, you name it, it was dumped down there. Uh, so we had no success in finding either the Mud Lake Mammoth or the Finsky Mammoth, but this one again is butchered. We've got butchering marks on here. Uh, the person who is a specialist in looking at these marks uh, can tell from their position, uh, how many there are, uh, and a lot of other little de details that I'm not a specialist at. Um, that both Fenske and Mud Lake were scavenged animals. They weren't actively hunted. They weren't fresh animals. They were a little harder to butcher. Schaefer site is interesting in that uh, in 1964, uh, the elder Frank Schaefer um, was putting a, tiling, uh, a tile through his uh, marshy field. Uh, his field was in between two glacial moraines. Really, really wonderful organic soil. It was a glacial lake at one time. It slowly infilled and became a, a cattail marsh uh, in 1836. It's down as a cattail marsh on the early maps. Uh, so wonderful to grow in, uh, but always wet. So farmers in that area are always putting tiles in to drain the water off the field. Well, in 64, they, they hit uh, an object. Uh, and it actually threw the operator off the machine. These machines are like giant caterpillar machines with a, with a wheel on front that has buckets on the end of the wheel. They're tremendously huge, and to have that happen, uh, they knew they hit something pretty big. Um, and what they hit was they actually went through the tusk of a mammoth, um, and then they hit the, uh, the femur, or the upper rear leg bone of a mammoth, uh, cut both of them in half. Uh, and brought up a few pieces of tusk ivory, as well as the uh, pieces of the femur. Back at that time, uh, another uh, amateur archaeologist that we knew at that time, uh, Phil Sander, went out there and made a map, and the map was awesome. Uh, these uh, bones that were brought up in 1964 were given to the Kenosha Public Museum. Uh, when Dave Wason told me that there were uh, he thought there were cut marks on Mud Lake and Fenske. I looked at them, agreed with him. I went back to our Schaefer bone at the public museum and looked at it, and it was like, eh, I didn't see any obvious marks. But we started to collect information about which of these sites uh, we could actually find, uh, you know, the, the easiest. And uh, we came across Phil, and Phil says, oh, I got a map. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's great. Um, and it is a great map. It has distances, bearings, uh, landmarks, all kinds of things. So Dave Wason and I went out there in uh, 1992 and uh, started excavating. Uh, we were working with Dave Overstreet out of Milwaukee, another archaeologist. And uh, within three days, we found the first bone. And the first bone is kind of cool. Well, actually, let's go back for a second. This is the bone that was in the museum from uh, 1964. So you can see they knew it was either a mammoth or a mastodon. There's no doubt that it's a huge animal. But the first bone we found um, is this guy here. And it doesn't look like much. It's a navicular. It's part of an ankle, basically. And in a human being, it's only about that long. So you can see we knew we had a big animal again. Uh, we started excavating around this and kept excavating and excavating, and we found a pretty huge bone pile. Uh, we excavated about uh, 60 cubic meters of uh, uh, soil in two years, and uh, we found the old drainage tile. We found where the tusk was cut in half. We found where uh, that piece of bone was uh, cut off with a femur in 1964. Uh, we found all kinds of spruce uh, that was in with the animal as well. Uh, and this animal was deposited either directly into shallow water 
uh, or it was inundated by shallow glacial lake uh, uh, shortly after it was deposited. Um, I think it's the former. Uh, it, was, it was deposited into a shallow water. A lot of these uh, mammoth kill sites that we find, there's a bunch of them in the western United States. There's only about 26 in the United States altogether. Uh, two right here that we've excavated, uh, Schaefer and Hebier, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, these animals are usually found in shallow water. Um, I have a theory about that, and we can never prove it, but um, I know that if an animal is gut wounded, it's, it's hitting the intestines in some way, uh, that uh, it'll develop a, an infection, uh, peritonitis, uh, it'll uh, uh, get a fever, it'll usually go stand in sh uh, shallow water, and it'll die after a couple days. Uh, so that's why I think we find them in shallow water. It's shallow water also preserves these things. Uh, if they were laying out on the surface, they would have deteriorated uh, and be gone. So here's, a, here's an example. Um, this was in, a, in the edge of a glacial lake, and this is a vertebrae pad, and this is a spine coming off of the vertebrae right here, and then all of this is spruce wood. Um, this is a little eddy area. There's a current. It's actually a ponded area of a, of a river. It's ponded into a pretty large lake, uh, about a half mile uh, wide and about a mile long. This is a little backwater area where stuff starts, kind of falls out of the stream, uh, the current, I should say, and uh, starts to swirl and eddy and lay right on top of the bones. This is great for archaeology simply because uh, we can not only date the bone, uh, we can date all the wood, too. Uh, we ran 33 different dates on this, on this animal. Uh, and all of the dates show that this animal uh, was killed 14,500 years ago, uh, which makes it um, the oldest mammoth kill site in North America. The ones in the western United States are about 1,500 years younger than that. Uh, a lot of people didn't believe it at first. Uh, it took like 20 years of... Uh, scientific investigation, a lot of my colleagues working on different aspects of this thing. Uh, we had snails that were analyzed, pollen analysis, uh, we had wood species analysis, we had soil analysis to tell us how the, uh, the, the, the area filled in over, over thousands of years. Uh, all kinds of specialists developed uh, a story, a complete story of the Schaefer mammoth. And we know this guy was killed uh, because we have those uh, stone tool marks. We also have an animal uh, that most of the bones were put in the pile, uh, just thrown into one spot, basically. Uh, all of the bones are not in their natural positions. They're not stuck together, except for two vertebrae. Uh, so this animal was thoroughly butchered. I mean, they took just about everything out of this guy. Uh, and the smoking gun uh, we found in the second season, underneath the pelvis, we lifted out the pelvis to basically plaster up and take back to the museum. And there were two stone tool fr flakes uh, underneath the, the animal. So those were stone tools made by humans. Uh, they were the first stone tools we found in the entire site. Uh, so that was kind of the smoking gun, and that's really what convinced people that this animal was killed and butchered at that time. We had people coming in, and they were even looking at the health and well-being of the animal. Um, this is uh, what they call the ascending ramus. This is actually the, the jaw side that hinges into your face. So it's like right right here. Uh, you can see this growth right here. That's not normal. Um, that's actually an uh, uh, ossification. That's actually a uh, damage. Uh, he was injured somehow. Uh, being a male, 32 years old, not quite fully grown, uh, could have been fighting with another animal, uh, could have been fighting with another mammoth, and got hit in the side of the head with a, with a tusk or something and got the bone infection. Um, the health and well-being of the animal, the health was actually pretty good. Uh, and even at 32 years old, he was not fully mature yet. Uh, so he was not uh, uh, out with his, uh, with his harem of uh, uh, female elephants, as they call it. Um, these are some of the dates that we have. We have bone dates and we have uh, wood dates. You can see they came from all over the bone pile, just all kinds of dates. And when you look at these dates, this is 12,290 plus or minus 60. That's a radiocarbon date. The actual calendar date is about 2,000 years older than that. So that would be 14,200. And then the last thing we want to talk about is uh, the dig itself. This is a reconstruction of the dig itself. Trench going through the, uh, the site itself. 
Um, underneath here is basically the skull. This is one of the upper teeth that was sticking out high. The skull was on its side and it actually collapsed down under its own weight at one point. We know that it was sticking up above the water because it, it wouldn't have collapsed like that if it wasn't. Uh, the air got to it and it started to collapse and it just went down. Um, this is the pelvis, or I should say half of the pelvis. Now to show you how disarticulated or torn apart this animal was, this is one half of the pelvis. This is the other half of the pelvis, way over here. This is a rear leg bone, upper, upper rear leg. This is a lower rear leg. The skull's over here, and the jaw should be right here, if it were still in its natural place. Well, the jaw's over here. So you can see it's really torn apart. Um, foot bones, ribs, uh, all kinds of things just laying around. There's a shoulder blade way over at the other corner over there. There's one shoulder blade in the corner that you're looking at right now, and there's another one. Uh, the other shoulder blade's way over here. If they were in their natural position, the shoulder blade should be way, way over there. We also know that this being a backwater, there was no current. Um, when we did the analysis of all the snails we found, we found 10 different species of snails. They all lived in water that was one to three feet deep, and it was all uh, backwater, very low energy environment. So we know these bones weren't moved around after they were deposited by currents. This is the second mammoth that was uh, excavated in Kenosha County. Uh, he's about three quarters of a mile away from the Schaefer mammoth. He's on the same glacial lake drainage. Uh, he's in a little more of an active area. Uh, so there is some bone movement, but not much. Um, he is a 40-year-old male, uh, fully mature. And what he is, is he's also butchered. He also dates from about the same time. There were two, no, four stone tools found with Hebeer. Um, and they show definitively that we've got butchering going on again at this time in this area. Uh, 1,500 years older than all the other mammoth sites in, uh, or mammoth butcher sites in North America. This is a reconstruction of the butchering scene uh, at the Schaefer site. Now what we did is we looked at where the marks were on the bone, the cut marks, uh, the stone tool marks. Uh, we looked at the sequence, the layering of the bones. We know that the bones at the bottom of the pile were the first ones there, right? Makes sense. Uh, so those were the first ones butchered. Uh, we know from other mammoth sites that a lot of times they concentrate on the front legs first. Uh, sometimes that's the only part they butcher. Uh, but as we know at Schaefer, they butcher just about everything. Why do you think they would go after the front legs instead of the rear? When you hunt today, well, like you hunt uh, deer, uh, elk, animals like that, most of the meat is in the rear legs, the rear haunches. Well, on the mammoths and mastodons, most of the meat is in the front legs. Uh, simply because you have a huge skull that you need to hold up. So there's a lot more muscle there. Uh, so they go after the, the main muscle first. So we have one leg removed. We have the other one right here. We have some <laughs> actually quite large uh, pieces of meat here. Uh, these are muscles taken out of the leg. We have a person inside uh, scraping out some of the materials. They've taken all the intestines out and they're butchering it from the inside. And we know that because we have butchering marks on the inside of the animal, on the inside of the bones. Uh, so we know that someone was inside of there. When you look at the murals in the background for all of these exhibits, the, all of the animals you see, all of the uh, uh, plants you see, all of the vistas you see, they're all based on geology, paleontology, palynology or pollen analysis. These are all reconstructions based on scientific literature that we know. So, come see us. Mm -hmm.